The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today for our Chem Careers webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking all about um, careers in teaching in higher education. Um, I've got a fantastic lineup for you today. Um, we've, we've got Dr. Susan Fergus, um, HE Teacher Award winner. Uh, Susan, can you say hello? Hello everyone. Uh, we've got um, Jenny Slaughter uh, from the University of Manchester. Jenny, say hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, Simon Lancaster from UEA up in Norwich. Hello. Uh, and we've got Jackie Robson from Durham. Hi, hi folks. Uh, yeah, hello. And Stephen from the University of Bath as well. Um, hello. My name's I'm Robert Bowles. Sorry, Stephen. My name's Robert Bowles. I'm uh, one of the careers advisors here at the RSC. Um, so I'm going to be kind of leading you through it today. Um, just to let you know, there will be the chance for you to ask questions. Um, you can enter them via text. What we'll do is we'll go through them at the end of the session. So if there's anything that you think about as we're talking through things, do please send it in and we'll try and get through to as many of them as, as you can. So just give you a bit of a, a structure. Susan, if you could maybe just um, tell everyone just a little bit about yourself and what you're currently doing. Okay, so I work at the University of Hertfordshire. I'm now an associate professor in learning and teaching. Uh, I've been there 12 years, so I started out um, doing my PhD and went down the postdoc route in research. Um, was always very interested in teaching and learning, and so I currently now am a learning and teaching lead, but I progress through the typical lecturer where you would be running a module, um, you'd have responsibility for research duties, teaching duties, and I, I've taken opportunities where I can, but I'm, that's kind of a very short synopsis right, of sorry. my journey, because I know we need to keep it brief. <laughs> Thank you. Jenny, do you want to say a few words? Um, yes, yeah, Sue, so I had a fairly similar career path to Suzanne. I came from a PhD uh, to a PDRA position, um, and I decided during my PDRA position that I really liked the teaching part of higher education, uh, so I moved into a teaching focused role and I've been doing that for about 10 years now, both at the University of Bristol and now in Manchester. Thank you, Jenny. Simon, a few words from you. Yes, um, very similar, really. I started off as a, as a research focused uh, academic, but um, migrated gradually oh over to an ever greater teaching role and now I'm entirely teaching focused. Fantastic. And Jackie? Yeah, so mine's a little bit different. I finished my PhD and went into secondary teaching. So I have my qualified teacher status. I did that for about nine years and then got a one year placement back at Durham sponsored by the RSC to be a school teacher fellow. Um, and that was nine years ago. I'm currently associate professor of teaching at Durham Uni. Thanks, Jackie. And finally you, Stephen. Uh, so I did the PhD, uh, went into a research and teaching fellowship uh, as my postdoc because uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and then in that, I found out pretty quickly once I didn't have a thesis to write, uh, research wasn't quite as motivating as the teaching was. And the teaching was great fun and people told me I was reasonably competent at it. Uh, and so then I went into my current position where I've been at Bath for four years where I'm teaching fellow for synthesis uh, and have an overview of a lot of our laboratory activities. Great. Thanks very much, Stephen. So just to give you a, a quick run through kind of the structure for the next session. So we're just going to talk a little bit about really the overview of the different um, teaching roles. And also, as you heard from the people with us today, a lot of them started out in research. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between teaching and research, um, a bit more about what actually is involved in teaching as well. Then moving on to some more practical advice. So really some tips about how to find those roles and then once you have found them really to kind of think about what experience you need um, what you need to be shown to prospective employers to kind of make sure that, that you can kind of secure those positions and then we're going to finish off with just a bit of an overview mm -hmm. of some of the support available from the RSC um, and some links to some, some other questions as well so hopefully that will give you a bit of a view of, of what we've got on. so just start off um, really just talking about the kind of teaching roles so most people do, as you heard, sort of transition into teaching from that research background. Um, as it, 
did you, did all of you sort of start on that that kind of doing the, the kind of contract in postdoc? How easy did you find that kind of link into those into teaching? Most of you seem to happen quite gradually. Um, Stephen, do you want a, a bit of a a point on that? Yeah, sure. So uh, for me, I got a one year research and teaching fellowship, which kind of it was a postdoc and I was asked to do it as a postdoc. And then it turned out that uh, who I was working for, I worked for David Smith in York um, and we needed a, an arrangement where I could cover his teaching. So that was an opportunity I just said yes to um, not being quite sure what I'd signed up for. Um, and then when I moved in at the end of that year, I was looking for a, a sort of a, a more bona fide teaching position, an education focused position. I got a three year position at Bath uh, and then that has since been renewed. But at Bath, I'm still on a temporary contract. So it's still, I guess, uh, has a, a sort of an echo of postdoc type role about it in the sense of it's a three year position and I've been extended for another three years. Great stuff. Thanks, Stephen. And what about the rest of you? Are you all now on um, on permanent sort of teaching contracts? Anyone? Yes. Yeah. And, and just to say at Hertfordshire, we've introduced uh, in the last number of years part time PhD with a teaching assistant element to it. And I think that focus has been to for somebody to do a PhD, but then to also develop those skills that are required for an academic teaching role. So compared to when I first was looking at um, academic roles in higher education, it was a very classical, traditional route. You've done your research career and then you stepped into the academic role. Whereas I think now there's a lot more diverse ways and approaches to, to come at it. It's not quite just the, the one size fits all. And just to support what Suzanne was saying, at Durham, there was nothing really for a teaching focus focused member of staff apart from short-term contracts up until uh, not that long ago. So I had a one-year contract which was extended for a further two years, extended for a further two years, um, but now I'm a teaching-focused academic. So we actually have a career path for teaching-focused staff who, rather than do traditional chemistry research, do scholarship and research and teaching and learning. Great stuff. So it sounds like things are, are maybe starting to, 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 to change a little bit there. Um, Simon, I just wanted to kind of bring you in here. Do you have the opportunity to do much research now or are you just primarily just teaching now? Well, one of the things I'd like to, to, to flag actually is the increasing tendency for, for people to be able to do a, a PhD in, in chemistry education research uh, and to come at a career in uh, chemistry education from that perspective because I, I think there, there are many of us who are PhDs are in traditional mainstream chemistry, but we're now increasingly um, uh, you know, learning social science skills and applying those in pedagogical research. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's uh, this is a very exciting time because there are people training as PhDs in chemistry education. Uh, and I think that that's going to uh, change the, the landscape a little. At my own institution, we, we have uh, a distinction between ATR, uh, Administration Teaching and Research Career Track, and ATS, uh, Administration Teaching and Scholarship. Uh, and I'm on the scholarship, but I think it's incredibly important that we, we do work to define what scholarship means uh, to retain a, a degree of currency in the chemistry that we do so that people do have lasting and enduring and involving careers. Great stuff. Thanks, Simon. S Susan, was there anything you added, wanted to add about this kind of range of teaching roles that are currently available? Um, so I think like what I said, that we there are different routes available. There isn't just a, a one, a kind of a one size fits all. But I know for me, when I first started out, the advice I was given was to to kind of do a little bit of everything and not maybe channels and say I'm only going to do a, a teaching focused role because it may be that you need a year or two to experience a little bit of everything across um, your academic position and then find out what it is you're really interested in or what you'd like to pursue in more detail because you may want to develop collaborations in research or you may want to, as Simon was saying, develop more along the, the pedagogical approaches and, and develop that side. So I think it's it can depend. Yeah, so it's very much 
find that the route that, that work, works best for you. So just kind of moving on a little bit from that, I just wanted to kind of really think about a bit more about kind of what's involved in your day to day. Um, some of some of the, the things I've seen tends to show that kind of people within that kind of permanent academic lecturing role, quite often they spend about a third of their time doing research, maybe a third of their time teaching and a third of their time doing more academic stuff. I guess you guys, you tend to be more towards focus just on the teaching and um, and the other kind of activities that you have to get involved in within the university to support that. Um, Jenny, do you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, so um, that's one of the things that really attracted me to this type of role it is exactly that diversity. Um, so in terms of day-to-day -day activities, yep, there's all the things you would expect with teaching, running courses, um, etc. But then, you know, here at Manchester, I also head the faculty team for GTA training. Um, and uh, work with others to develop um, HEA or H advanced HE accreditation routes for our GTAs. So there is really a, a huge diversity. Um, and as Simon has already picked up on, you do also get to develop other attributes such as your social research skills um, to support the kind of pedagogic research alongside that. So. Uh, yeah, it's really quite diverse. So, so part of, part of what you do then is is really those managing those, those complex kind of workflows. Um, Je Susan, do you want to maybe comment on that? Do you have quite a lot that you kind of have to keep a track on all, all at the same time? You are multitasking. Um, you have to be able to deal with many different things in a day and communicate at different levels. So whether you're communicating with senior managers and then you're communicating with a first year undergraduate student in the next 10 minutes. And it's, it's very diverse, which I think is one of the things we really enjoy about the role is that no two days are the same. Um, I think on top of your academic teaching aspects and the administration side and perhaps some research if you are or some scholarly activities that you're engaged in. There may also, depending on your institution and their focus and their mission and strategic plan, there may be other opportunities to develop areas. For example, if there's an international aspect, you may have opportunities to go abroad to link with some collaborative institution or I had a, an opportunity last year to go on an Erasmus exchange and visit a university in Spain um, and do a training visit there. So it, it's not always the day to day will be a very teaching admin, maybe some research or scholarly activity, but there are also other opportunities to develop your professional career and also to experience aspects of your career that will develop leadership and communication and perhaps offer further possibilities within your career trajectory. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Susan. Um, Steve, I'm just going to bring you in if I can. Can you tell a, a little bit about the kind of peaks and troughs of the, of the working year? Is it is it quite seasonal? Yeah, I mean, I, I always view sort of my role as having a seasonal aspect to it. It's not your typical summer winter season, it's when the students are there and when the students are not. And when the students are there, I'll, I think we'd all agree, you tend to find, you might find yourself teaching at first year level in front of however many students and then in the next hour you might have a small group class with you know third years uh, and that has a challenge in itself. And one of the things that I find with the seasonality in that aspect is having to predict when you're going to have no time to sort anything out and so do a lot of preparative preparatory work um, sometimes months in advance so that when you get to that point in the furnace heat of semester teaching uh, everything's in place i quite like that i find that uh, quite satisfying to be able to map out you know several months at a time and kind of know roughly what i'm going to be doing at different times great thanks Stephen. um something that that has come up in, in recent times that you're probably all exposed to and aware of is the is the teaching evaluation framework um, so I'm, can I just bring you in on that? Do you think that's having an impact on how universities are seeing teaching? Is it having an impact on the way they're recruiting sort of academic lecturers and, and teaching at this, teachers at this point? 
Uh, I think it's it's unquestionably having uh, having an impact. It requires uh, departments and people like myself, directors of learning and teaching within departments, to be extremely reflective about what they're going on and and to be able to to not just to point to what they're doing, but to evidence the impact of what they're doing and all sorts of things then become evident and one really positive aspect of the teaching excellence framework there are negative ones but one really positive one is that we now evidence and point to career progression on our teaching focused academic staff so it's a very much a positive for us to be able to see say that we have um, teaching focused staff at all the academic levels and have been promoted between them. It's a very much a positive for us to be able to point at things like uh, HE, um, Senior Fellowship of the Higher Education Academy qualification, uh, the UK Professional Standards Framework qualifications, and, and to be able to evidence those and point at them. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. So hopefully from those few words, you've got a bit more of an overview of kind of what's actually involved in sort of higher education teaching at the moment. Um, we're going to move now on to really kind of thinking about, you know, how you can kind of secure this sort of position, what you need to be thinking about, how can you find those positions, what you need to be demonstrating to, to kind of institutions that you apply to. Um, so I've just put some information up on, on the screen now. There is a lot of it. I'm not going to go through it all. Um, but what, what's clear from a lot of research that's been done by um, people like Vito, by jobs.ac.uk, um, other kind of people involved in kind of academic recruitment is that most people that current, currently work in academia uh, most tend to find their their job through their professional or their educational contacts. Um, does that resonate with, with with all of you? Has anyone got any comments on that? I think I mean we've we've recently just appointed a load of, um, of teaching focused staff and it was very clear that um, teaching in higher education is very much thought to be something that you have to do from within higher education so that doesn't surprise me in the slightest but I have started to see a, a, an increase in people applying from traditional secondary chemistry teaching backgrounds or secondary teaching backgrounds and I think um, you know that's becoming more that the skills and things required in a specialist teacher especially in the environment of TEF that we're in at the moment as Simon was saying you know I think that those kind of skills are, are important as well so I think um, you know I've had contact from a lot of teachers asking how to make that transition from secondary teaching or a different teaching background at college teaching that kind of thing into higher education and I think that's becoming more of a popular route but traditionally it's only been higher education based I would say. Thank, thanks Jackie that, that's really really valuable insight. Um, Anyone, anyone else? Are any of you kind of involved in recruiting academic staff? What, are you seeing any trends in terms of where your candidates are coming from? Hello? I think it's difficult to come up, Robert, with a, with a really definitive answer to that question okay. because there's such variation in practice. Okay. Um, Still, you know, uh, I mean, I work in a department and, uh, and I'm very much involved in the recruitment in our department. But we're, you know, we have 25, uh, 25 lecturers, of which five or so are teaching focused and the other 20 do teaching, but they're, they're research focused. So it's not, a, it's not that frequent that we employ someone on a teaching focused role. Okay. Um, no, that, that's good. That, I think going back to the, the, the recruitment that we've just been doing, I think it's it's very clear that, I mean, I've been on panels outside of the departments to recruit teaching focused staff across the university. And I think that's an, a, a focus point for quite a few institutions, this development of a, of a teaching track. And it is, as Simon said, it's it's very clear that each role is very varied and diverse. And the applicants that we get for each role and the background experience that they have is very diverse. But I would say that the, the commonalities, generally speaking, they have PhDs already in a, usually in a, a, a discipline specific context. Um, but as Simon said, there's opportunities now for, for pedagogical type PhDs, which of course would be very useful. Um, at second, secondary teachers and, and, you know, overseas and things like that, the, the reach is getting greater because the, you know, the, the roles are coming up more now, I would say. Okay. So yeah, I think it's the very varied backgrounds and experience. 
Fantastic. And I think as well to add to that, it, it even though we've been talking about our backgrounds and our experiences, we've been recently employing academics who've had a, an industrial background. They've had a, an industrial career prior to then entering into an academic career. So there there is no barrier to say you have to have done X, Y or Z. It's, it's actually, for now, we actually want, and I think higher education are looking beyond just a traditional research focused route. They, we want to look at employability skills and bringing in expertise from different backgrounds and different environments to help enrich the department or help enrich the university and the teaching. So, so that, that's really useful. Thank you, Susan. So really kind of building on that, is there any uh, more thoughts you can think of really about, you know, how people, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this are considering a career in teaching in HE. So what sort of advice would you give them? You know, how can they stand out? What is it you think that universities are starting to, to value now more? How do they stand out from those other people that are coming from that really wide range and diverse range of backgrounds? Um, I think certainly experience in HE teaching. Um, yeah. if, if people are doing PhDs, then you know as much you know the demonstrating experience that they're doing. If they're working in teaching labs, if they're helping support tutorial teaching in their own departments, I think it's about being able to demonstrate not only that that's been done in a passive sense, but they've taken it a bit further. So most institutions will offer. Um, sort of HEA routes to get Associate Fellow of Higher Education Academy. That's a you know, very widely recognised role, a widely recognised route to get, you know, to, to show that you have some wider teaching experience and pedagogical awareness. And that's quite important for us. Great stuff. Uh, yeah, you, I, I was just going to echo Jackie, Jackie's comment that um, absolutely getting the experience is fantastic. Um, diverse experience, again, great for PhD students, but if you can add to that then uh, the accreditation to show that not only has it been done but it's also been done to a national standard um, and these things that the advanced HE fellowships uh, are now more and more widely recognized so internationally as well as within the UK so they can really help um, somebody looking for a career uh, like this stand out from the crowd. Great stuff Jenny and Stephen I know that you, you've talked in the past certainly to me and other events really about how you can kind of look at getting experience while you're doing a PhD, while you're postdocing, um, really while you're demonstrating it's important to, to learn about how courses are run and developed. Is there anything you want to kind of add about that, about how to seek out those opportunities? Yeah, um, I mean I completely agree with what, uh, what's what been said before me um, and perhaps I should shine a light on if, if the opportunity isn't available uh, to get HGA accreditation because that, well, that would always be kind of an ideal scenario but if it's not something that, that's probably good to do is demonstrate that you're reflecting on what you've done so you might not have done as much teaching as somebody else but if you can demonstrate through applications and, and in your experience that you've looked back and thought well that bit of teaching I did those interactions I had with the students were really good and and maybe that's because of how I approached them the way I managed the conversation sort of th that it shows you've really engaged with that process um, and another thing that can be I mean if I if I put my sort of teaching laboratory hat on or, or lab coat perhaps um, and think well what would be useful is, is seeing beyond kind of uh, behind the curtain, I guess, how are the courses actually put together and, and spending time just having those little conversations with the academics running courses that you may be demonstrating on to give you kind of that added value, that insight into the reality of what we do, I guess, um, which, which can then make you stand out in an interview scenario, perhaps. Thanks, Stephen. Simon, you're, you're kind of leading the course there up at UEA. Kind of endorse that approach have you got anything else to add oh, kind of around that yeah no, thanks thanks for the opportunity to do to do exactly that yeah i'd like to echo everything that uh, that jackie and and jenny and and, and stephen have, have just said uh, and if case it's not entirely obvious to the people uh, listening into this webinar people in the position of module organizer laboratory organizer director of learning and teaching director of undergraduate studies um, if you go to them uh, and say I'd like to gain a little bit of additional teaching experience then they will bite your hand off 
Um, <laughs> the, the whole sector is, is crying out for people to, to help out and, uh, and, and get involved in doing things like this. Obviously, there's always um, a, a balance to be struck with your supervisor and your postdoctoral research uh, contract or your PhD. But I think most uh, supervisors now are also wearing a hat of module organizers, so they have the, the sympathy in that direction. But they realize that they're giving people an opportunity to develop their skills is a really important part of the mentoring and training process. So if it's not entirely obvious, there are a huge number of opportunities to get teaching ex experience out there. So I think the kind of takeaway away from that section really is to kind of you know, take responsibility for it yourself. You know, if those opportunities aren't being being presented to you, um, you know, be proactive, make things happen. You know, find those opportunities. Can you look for ways to kind of get a really wide range of experience, really as as, as quickly and as uh, as you can? And that does offer offer a great, excellent opportunity to do that. So thanks very much uh, for that. I'm just going to flag up a few websites. Um, on on the screen now um there's a link to, to the to us the career support team at the rsc we provide a lot of support to our membership um a lot of them are kind of talking interested in kind of pursuing careers within academia further afield as well so we do have a lot of experience of, of talking people through that there's a really good site at, at manchester i'm sure there are other sites available as well but this is only one i've come across that has a really good overview of academic careers um, and things for you to think about as you're planning your your kind of careers. If you're looking for jobs that are currently being advertised, then jobs.ac.uk is a really good starting point for that. Um, and also, if you're in that kind of reflective mood, wanting to think about how to develop your your skills in terms of, you know, for, from a teaching point of view while you are doing research, um, then take a look at uh, the VTI website. Um, if you are registered at an institution that subscribe to VTI. There are a number of resources they offer. There is a kind of research and development framework they offer, which does have a kind of teaching lens. So how to develop yourself as a researcher, certainly within the context of, of searching for kind of research, uh, searching for, for teaching experience. So well worth having a look at that. Um, I'm just going to finish off before we move on to the questions, really just to kind of go around all of the panelists and just really kind of ask them just to say the one thing that they love most about what they currently do. So um, just to kind of get you a feel for why you might want to take this, this career route. So let's start off with, uh, let's start off with Susan on this one. What's the one thing you love about what you currently do? Why should people do the it? One, the one thing I love, um, I really enjoy when I'm working with students directly and teaching with them and they are having um, difficulties with understanding some aspect of the chemistry that we are going through and then maybe we're looking at it from different ways or we start looking at other problems and applying their knowledge and then there's suddenly the light bulb moment goes off and they go ah oh, now I get it and you see their their energy they they smile they they just it, it that for me is the that's what I really love about what I do great stuff thanks it's making a difference with the students yeah Jenny, let's move on to you. So, um, in a similar fashion, I, I really love working with the students, and it's when they ask me the questions that change my way of thinking, and that happens every single day. Um, and I, I really hope my students keep challenging me like that because that's what really keeps me switched on during the day. Brilliant, Jenny. Simon, what about yourself? Well, occasionally people say to me, you know, don't you miss the laboratory having moved from a, from a research focus to a, to a teaching focus? Uh, and my answer to that is absolutely not, because for me, every day in the lecture theatre, in the classroom, in the laboratory is a, is a new experiment in trying to make the teaching more effective. So, you know, I, I get all the same thrills uh, from doing the research classic research aspect, researching into what makes teaching more effective. Great stuff. Jackie, what about yourself? Well, for me, as a, as a school teacher, I get asked, do I not miss the classroom? And my answer would be absolutely not. In a similar vein to uh, Suzanne and, and Jenny, I love the fact that I, I work with the incoming students very closely. I work very much with first year students because of my background. But then watching them graduate four years later and seeing what changes have happened in their lives and in their development and you know seeing where they go later is just the, the best the best feeling in the world. 
Fantastic. And Stephen, we, we've left the hardest job for you to say something else or come up with another way of saying it. Or you could just reiterate oh. what everyone else is saying. I think mine falls somewhere between what Jenny and Jackie have said in that I, I really like this watching students develop uh, and that progression and, and it's a slow burner uh, to get that sort of that satisfaction of you know you work with students in year one and then come back work with them in year three and see how they've developed these real world skills that we we often talk about but actually seeing that in practice and and if you had to pinpoint one moment it's the moment when they realize they're talking to you as an equal because <laughs> you're both talking about something that you don't know the answer to and so you're working that out together i really like that if i had to pinpoint one great stuff thanks steve that sounds a, a great place to finish um i'm just gonna throw up on screen if you do have any questions after we finish today, um, do please get in touch. There's all our contact details on screen. You can just email careers at rsc.org. You can contact me via LinkedIn or Twitter or go and have a look at our website. Um, we have had a few questions coming in. Um, thank you for those. If you do have another one as well, if anyone else listening wants to add some as well, do please uh, drop us a, a question now uh, while we're still here. Um, so we've had a couple, one here actually about membership of, of professional bodies. Um, and how that could benefit in your academic career. Now, I could do a whole other webinar just on that, but um, Simon, maybe let's have a, a kind of someone that doesn't work for the RSC answering that question, <laughs> get a bit more of an objective viewpoint on that. Simon? I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person uh, because I am, of course, president of the Education Division Council of the Royal Society of Chemistry, okay. and I would strongly <laughs> encourage everybody who is uh, in interested in this field to join the education division and to join the tertiary, uh, sorry, the higher education group now. And there is a chemistry education research group. Um, uh, I think you would find those all very interesting. So not entirely innocent. I'm afraid, <laughs> Great stuff. So very much kind of use, use the, the professional bodies to kind of build up your, your professional networks within the field that you want in. I think that would be Absolutely. the main thing I'd say. Does anyone else want to add anything on, on that point? I think we probably just need to make sure we mention Advance HE as well in terms of, you know, you can you can go and use their resources and look at their website and get yourself accredited that way just to back up some of the things we said earlier. Great stuff. What website was that? So it's Advance HE. Okay. It used to be the um, Higher Education Academy. Uh, Jenny, you'll correct me if I've got it. Got it not quite right, but oh, it's where you get your... Absolutely um, right. <laughs> yeah, where you, thank you. Where you get your associate fellow of the high, of the associate fellow, it's AFHEA and things like that. That's your accreditation that shows you've engaged with teaching at a reflective and a pedagogical level. So that's the the accreditation we were talking about earlier. I would recommend that on top of the RSC, of course. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Um, someone else. Um, yes, someone's talked about the higher education teaching fellowship. Do you have any knowledge of that at all? Has anyone heard of that? Sorry, I missed, I missed that. Did you say the higher education yeah. teaching, fellowship? teaching fellowship? Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's, I'll hand that to Jenny because I think that's what we've just been talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess there are two types of uh, kind of membership of bodies that we've been talking about. And one is membership of bodies like the RSC, um, as Simon elucidated to, which, yeah, you know, gives you loads of links to networks um, and opportunities, workshops. Um, and events that are going on um, and then you've got the accreditation as well so we have uh, the UK professional standards framework that's already been mentioned by Simon earlier um, and you can apply through the HEA or they are now called advanced HE for accreditation um, of your teaching practice um, and there was a really nice research paper recently that showed the impact this can have because uh, a lot of even research focused roles in academia now a seeking teaching experience and this is a way to say not just do I have this experience but also I've got it at a, a level that's recognized nationally. Lovely that's a really succinct can answer. I, Thanks very much. Yeah can I just add to that as well sorry um, at, at uh, many institutions you can do um, a postgraduate certificate of academic practice or something similar to that which is a, sort of an HE postgrad certificate of, of teaching which also is accessible to people in sort of postdoc and postgrad roles you normally have to ask to, to access it it's normally a, I mean we use it as a probationary requirement for our incoming lecturers but that's also something worth looking into in your own institution great stuff thanks 
Um, another question coming in. Um, how does outreach fit into the situation with, with all of you? Um, Susan, do you want to maybe start, on, start us on this? Are you involved in outreach at all? Um, we do have master classes that we invite students from secondary schools to come in and visit our laboratories during their towards the end of their summer term and we have a summer residential for students to again come in and experience chemistry within a, a laboratory setting. Um, so they are two activities that we would specifically have at, at my university. Um, so again, as part of the academic role, there are opportunities to engage with outreach activities um, beyond just the teaching of um, undergraduate students. Great, I'd also add as well that that's something that I look for when when people are applying for teaching focused roles. If they've got outreach experience, it's usually, especially in post uh, post grad, post doc positions, um, if they've got outreach experience, it shows they've used their initiative to go and get some more science communication. Um, experience and um, expertise so it's always worth getting involved with. That's really good. And I think after the... Yeah, um, when you're, I when you're at... oh, go <laughs> ahead Jenny, I think we're, we're all trying to talk at the one time, go ahead. I <laughs> um, know I was just going to follow on from yourself and Jackie and just say um, it also outreach can really help in the diversity of experience and helping somebody to understand where the students are coming from so that when you're going for that job application, you can talk about, look, I, I understand what a kind of previous education for these students looks like. And it just gives you that reflective ability that Stephen was talking about earlier. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm just going to wrap it up there. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, everyone, to our panellists for giving up your, your time this at lunchtime to, to share on you, your experience and your thoughts. Um, Hopefully that's given you some thoughts, those of you listening, to, to kind of think about it. Um, and really kind of, yeah, be proactive. Look for those opportunities. They do exist. It is competitive. But if you do make that effort, see what's out there. There are opportunities for you to, to go forward. Thanks very much for listening. Um, we will be uploading this webinar to, to YouTube as well fairly soon. So if you want to listen again or if you've missed anything, do please uh, get in touch and you can look at it on, on YouTube as well. Thanks everyone for taking part.